And uh, the Wilhites have become our friends and they're, they're a real blessing to us. Uh, Brother Jerry Wilhite is going to be our speaker this morning. Um, he's going to be coming back next month and uh, presenting some things about Noah and the ark and, and so on. Uh, he's built an ark. Now, it's not full size, so we'll be all right. But uh, we're, we'll be looking forward to that in, in the month of April. They'll be back. But this morning, Brother Jerry Wilhite is going to, to speak for us. I'm going to be speaking on a subject about David and Goliath, and we have a little song. You'll probably recognize the first verse. You may not recognize the second verse, but we've adapted it just for Fellowship Baptist Church, so I hope that you'll appreciate it. Only a boy named David, only a little sling. Only a boy named David, but he could pray and sing. Only a boy named David, only a rippling brook. Only a boy named David, but five little stones he took. And one little stone went into the sling, and the sling went round and round. And one little stone went into the sling, and the sling went round and round. And round and round and round and round and round and round and round. And one little stone went up in the air. And the giant came tumbling down. Only Fellowship Baptist, only a smaller church. Only Fellowship Baptist to do God's greatest work. Only Fellowship Baptist, only a few saved souls. Only Fellowship Baptist with heaven as her goal. She prayed and worked and followed God to see some lost folks saved. She prayed and worked and followed God to see some lost folks saved. She prayed and worked and prayed and worked and prayed and worked and prayed. And faithfulness to God's task brought glory to his name. So if you have your Bible, turn, if you will, to that text in 1 Samuel, chapter 17. Is there not a cause? The story before us is a familiar story. Many saved and unsaved folks alike know it. But there are some aspects about the story that can teach us some lessons about taking on giants. Now, we have giants in our lives. We probably all have some sort of a giant. It might be a stubborn habit. It might be a looming task. It might be a major problem. It might be a strong-willed child. It could be an unbearable employer or some sort of a devilish stronghold. But I want us to think this morning about a smaller church in a land of giants. And I want us to think of five truths here this morning that I think can help our church here and the church that we're seeking to start in Dalby and perhaps maybe a lot of smaller churches in areas where they seem to be facing some giants. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will meet with us in a special way. We know that when we open up a Bible, Lord, you are trying to say something to us. Help us to give some thoughts that might be a help, a hope, and encouragement to the folks here in this area, especially in these day, age in which we live, some of the challenges that are all around us, all around the world. I pray that we would learn and grow and be blessed from having opened up the word this morning and been here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, stick with me. I want to try to give you five truths here that I hope and trust can be a blessing on how to face these giants as a smaller church. Now, I know there's five truths here, but uh, I'll try not to make it too long. I tell people I'm a short preacher. It's kind of nice to be standing up here taller than somebody for once, but anyway... I want you to consider the first truth, and we find it here in our text, found in the first few verses here. And we have to realize, first of all, that there's a definite, there's a definite champion. And the first several verses bring this out. And I want you to notice in the first three verses 
that there is a general battle. There is a general battle. The first three verses say, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekah in Ephes Daman. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. Now at this point we don't see Goliath introduced yet. But we do recognize that there is a general battle. Uh, we have personal battles. We have church battles. And sometimes they are difficulties and they are challenges. In fact, the Bible indicates that the Philistines often were attacking the Israelites. And sometimes it just seems like there's always a battle and there's no reprieve. There's no break. There's always the enemy. And in fact, it says Philistines, plural, and battles, plural. And it just seems like it, there's always some challenge that's going on. I, I guess that probably makes us pray more. And look to God more. But God's people, and if you've newly gotten saved or you haven't gotten saved yet, there's something you need to understand, and that is that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. And it is for soldiers. So there is the general battle, but then in verses 4 through 7, we find the gigantic battler. Now we get introduced to this guy named Goliath. Look at verse 4. It says, There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him now consider this gigantic battler when i say gigantic battler it's not that the israelites were not accustomed to having fought some giants there had been giants in their history there was og there were the anakim there were the emims in fact the bible says that their land was kind of dotted in various areas with giants one area was spoken of as being the land of the giants. Another area was called the valley of the giants. And so it's like they had these giants all around them. But here was a giant that was unlike any other giants that they had faced. The Bible calls him a champion. That word champion comes from the same word campus. A campus or an area, a field, a paddock. Now, this champion, this guy that would stand out in the field and, and challenge and, and try to be a mediator between these two groups, of course, being on the side of one group, you can see exactly what Goliath is doing. Now, Goliath is very real. He has a name. Usually, we don't name something that's not real. He was from a specific place, this city of Gath, which was one of the five major cities of the Philistines. And the Bible says that he was so high that, well, just to give you some idea, he was probably about as high as what it is to the edge of this uh, shade right here. Nine and a half to 12 feet high, almost four meters high is how tall he was. Now, I'm not even two meters. Can you imagine me meeting a guy that's four meters tall? And the Bible says that his armor was a coat of mail, and that wasn't all these letters pasted on him. I mean, it was a type that kind of looked like fish scales. It was made of metal, and, it, and the Bible tells us how much it weighed. Now, just that coat of mail that he had on, it's not talking about the armor on the legs, just this coat that he had on was about three times what I weigh. That's pretty heavy. So this guy isn't just tall and skinny like Ribo. I mean, he's big, like Brother Wilhite, okay? So he's tall and fat. So he's able to carry all of this weight. In fact, it says that his, his spear was like a weaver's beam. And if you can imagine maybe somebody weaving some sort of a, a fabric, there were different sizes of looms and different sizes of, of the beams, but the, the spearhead weighed eight and a half kg why that's can you imagine i mean that 
That's twice the weight of a baby when it's born. That's just the head of the spear. So here's this guy with all of his armor, his size, his, his weapons. And I think that he pictures Satan in our midst who doesn't want us to do what God wants us to do. Satan is called Abaddon, which means destroyer. He's called the accuser of the brethren, the adversary, the angel of the bottomless pit, and Beelzebub and Belial. The devil, he's our common enemy, and references for all this. You can go right through your Bible and see he's the great red dragon and the liar and, and the murder and the old serpent and the power of the darkness. He's the prince of this world and demons and the power of darkness, power of the air. He's the ruler of the darkness of this world. The Bible calls him Satan, or he's our adversary. He is seen as a serpent. And we may think that Australia has a lot of poisonous snakes. Well, he's the most poisonous. He's the spirit that works in all disobedient people, Ephesians 2.2. 2. He's the tempter, the god of this world, the unclean spirit, the wicked woman. I probably left some out. But that's who our enemy is. And we've got to realize as a young or small church that there is a definite champion. But I want you to see in the next few verses, the second truth is that we need to recognize his defiant challenge. We need to recognize his defiant challenge. Look at verse 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now consider, first of all, his defiance. Then I want you to see his arrogance and then his insistence and so on. Consider his defiance. Now, in the cases of single combat, a warrior used to go out in front of his party and advancing towards the opposite ranks, he would challenge someone in that enemy army to fight him. One author has said, if his formidable appearance or great reputation for physical strength and heroism deterred any from accepting the challenge, he used to parade himself within hearing of the enemy's lines and specify in a loud, boastful, bravado style, defying them and pouring out torrents of abuse and insolence to provoke their resentments. I mean, you can see that's exactly what he's doing. He is defying God's army. He is defying the people of God. He is defying what God planned to use in that day. And the devil today defies to use his people in his place to do his greatest task. I believe that the Lord Jesus walks in the midst of the, can the candlesticks, uh, the New Testament churches, Revelation 2 and 3. And Satan hates the Lord Jesus. And so he is going to hate any kind of church that is sided up with the Lord Jesus. You got to understand that he's an enemy. You have an enemy. So we find his defiance. Verse 8 shows us his arrogance. Now Goliath knew that he had the upper hand. Uh, he thought he did. I mean he's big. He's strong. He's got the weapons. He's got an army behind him. He's got cowering people in front. I mean all he had to do was just lift up his voice and they ran. He's got the upper hand, it would seem here, and he's very proud. In fact, uh, it's believed that Goliath was the one who killed some of those priests, Hophni and Phinehas, and took the Ark of God and set it in front of Dagon. It's believed that he did that. Now, if he did, he was several years old, which means that he wasn't just a young, inexperienced, cocky kind of a guy. He knows what he's done. He's won his battles. He's got a lot of medals on his chest. That's who he considered. I mean, and of course, you think of Satan's pride in Isaiah 14 and how he said, I will do this and I will do that and I'll do this and that and that. And he didn't, but he certainly was proud about it. So you find the defiance and the arrogance, but notice in verse number 8 and 10, his insistence. Notice what, notice what he says. He says, give me a man. Give me your best. 
Now stop and ponder that. Give me your best. You pick out, and, and let me just challenge you, okay, think, okay, who is our best? Who's maybe the young one? Who's the, who's the one that shows promise? And who are the ones that have their family together, their act together, whatever? And you might be thinking, here's our, the devil wants the best. He wanted it then. He wants it now. He wants to fight. He wants to defeat. He wants to destroy. He wants to discourage. He did it then. He's doing it now. Things haven't changed with him. He still wants our best. He wants our young people. He wants our families. He wants our firstborn. He wants our churches. He wants our time. He wants our resources. He wants our energies. He wants our mind. He's after the best that we have to offer. Look at verse 16. Let's drop down there. I want you to see that the Philistine, the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself. How many days, kids? Forty days. Forty days. Forty times two? Eighty times. He comes out and says, give me your best. Let him take me on. And then he does it in the evening. And then he did it, does it tomorrow, morning and evening, the next day, for six weeks. Listen, the devil doesn't give up. He doesn't quit. I mean, he came after Joseph in the Old Testament there, that, that Potiphar's wife, day after day after day, and time after time after time. And I know sometimes, I was just noticing in our Sunday school class this morning that the, uh, the enemy wears out the saints of the Most High. <sighs> if it's not war, it's words and it's weariness. And sometimes you just get tired of the battle and tired in the battle. And you get weary and you struggle. And, and you know, maybe as a church you've been around for a few years, you say, oh, what's it? trying and trying to win that we get this person. We can't get that. It's a battle and it's tiring his insistence and his persistence but look at verse number 11 back in verse 11 when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine they were dismayed and greatly afraid look at his performance look what he accomplished he used fear he used fear that word probably is getting preached on more this day around in churches around the world than any word or concept, idea, we see it all around us. And you can just see it manifested in all, every place you look. And I would just encourage you to fear thou not, for I am with thee. I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. God doesn't want us to operate in fear. Because when the enemy gets that foothold, you can see what happens to lives, to families, uh, countries, governments, schools. Fear, fear, fear. <clears throat> so he managed to instill fear into God's people. And let me just say, if there's ever a time for us not to respond in fear, it's when everybody else is reacting and responding in fear. Think back in Israel's history at Kadesh Barnea. Twelve men went to spy on Canaan. Ten were bad and two were good. What do you think they saw in Canaan? Ten were bad and two were good. Some saw giants, big and strong. Some saw grapes in clusters, long. Some saw God was in it all. Ten were bad and two were good. I mean, it worked then. It worked in Gideon's day. Remember, 32,000 came out against the 120-some thousand of the Midianites? And God said, now, if you're afraid, go home. And two-thirds of the army packed up and went home. Fear is so debilitating, and that's why God says, fear not. Genesis 15, 1, fear not, Abraham. Genesis 46, 3, fear not, Jacob. Exodus 14, 13, fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He said that to the first generation of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Fear not, neither be discouraged. He said that to the second generation of Jews in Deuteronomy 1. 
He said to Joshua and Gideon and Ruth and the widow of Zarephath and Elisha's servant and Solomon and Ezekiel and Daniel and Zacharias and Mary and Joseph the husband of Mary and the shepherds and the father of the deceased maiden and the women at the tomb of Jesus and to Paul, fear not. And that message hasn't changed, to fear not. So we have to realize there is a definite champion, there is a defiant challenge, but look if you will in verse number 12. We need to rely on God as a dependent child. Verse number 12 says, Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shema. And, and you know how the story goes. And David is instructive his father to take some cheeses and go to the army and see how the boys are doing and give the cheeses to the captain and, and check things out. And so he goes. He gets there, and verse 22 says, And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted or greeted his brethren there. And as he talked with them, who shows up but Goliath? And of course, this has got a boy's attention. I mean, if a giant walked in here, it'd have everybody's attention, but especially the boys as they're looking up. Man, I remember trying to play basketball when I was in high school. We had this team that we played. It was called Martinsdale St. Mary. It was a Catholic school. It was a private school. And so kids came in from all over the state of Iowa, and they got on this team. Well, we had to work with just the ones that we had in our little town of Russell, Iowa. I mean, if you know where that is, you're from there so small we played St. Martin's and we played in the first time and we didn't beat them because the guys were all tall their shortest guy was about a foot taller than our tallest guy so my coach said this he said okay Will Height we're gonna make you the center you're gonna be the center and I'm not kidding you, I was playing against a guy that was six foot eleven and I'm five foot four you know if if they hang me up so he says you're gonna be the center and Man, I, I, and it was really hilarious. That was in the days when they used to start with a jump ball. Maybe they still do in some, but you remember the jump ball at center court? And I walk out there in that center circle, and there I am, and here's this guy as tall as that string up there, and it's going to be a jump ball. Can you just picture that? I mean, everybody's just laughing at the little guy out there. Well, you know what? We beat him because then our taller guys were out there on some of their shorter guys, and we were still out height. You know, higher than, they were higher than us, but boy, that was like living in the land of giants. Never forget that game. Here's David now as a shepherd boy, and I don't know, maybe a teenager. I'm guessing a teenager of some sort. And he sees this giant come out there and start hollering out, give me a man. And I want you to see some things here that this is a real contrast between Goliath in size, age, and experience and his dependence. Because Goliath is depending upon himself and David's going to depend upon God. Now, oftentimes, God used and uses weak and humble vessels or instruments. He used a rod in Moses' day, a jawbone of a donkey. In Samson's day, a handful of meal and oil. Remember that story? Remember the cloud that was the size of a man's hand that brought all this rain? Remember that little captive maiden girl that God used? God uses children out of the mouth of babes. He uses a mustard seed, Matthew 13. How about that boy with five barley loaves? and two small fishes. God's used that. I'd like to ask the question that God asked. Who hath despised the day of small things? God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. Whenever we interpret our Bibles, and we saw that this morning in Sunday school, we need to realize that Jesus Christ is on every page of the Bible. David here is a beautiful picture of Christ who defeated the greatest foe, the enemy, death, and Satan, when he arose from the grave. 
And if this is picturing anything, it certainly pictures Christ. But I want to make this applicable to us as if we were David or as if Fellowship Baptist Church was David. Think about this. What does it take to fight and defeat a giant? Well, first of all, David was on the right side. And individually, can I ask you this morning, are you on the right side? Are you on the side of God's people like David was? Or are you across the valley on the other side? Second of all, I want you to see, it says that David went and, re, I'm in verse 12, I'm sorry. David was the son of Jesse and David was loved by his father. Can you grab a hold of that? That God loves his children? Well, if God was this and that, he wouldn't allow that and this. David was loved of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Romans 1, 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God. Romans 5, 8, God commendeth his love toward us. Christ loved the church and gave himself. You know, sometimes we think because we have a battle, God must not love us. Because we have a challenge or a difficulty, we must think God doesn't love us. That's our thinking. So David was on the right side of the battle. David was loved of God. That's the meaning of his name, by the way. Thirdly, David took on the task even when those nearest and dearest to him did not. Did you notice it names his brothers? Now, he must have cared about those brothers. When his dad sent him with those cheeses, he didn't just go down in the backside of the, the paddock and just munch those down himself. No, he actually took those to his brothers. I think he cared about his brothers. And his brothers should have cared about him. But here he is in the middle of this task when there are others that are bigger and stronger and older and they're not doing the task. And now he's being ridiculed for wanting to do the task. He took on that task. And, you know, you may have every earthly reason, you think, for not taking on a challenge or a task when God says, take on the challenge, take on the task. I think, fourthly, David was faithful and responsible in the little task. Did you notice back in verse number 15, it says, David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. He did the little things. If you drop down a little bit further, it tells us that he, in verse 20, he left the sheep with a keeper. And then he got in the carriage and he took off for the battle zone. And it says down there in verse 22, David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage. You see how responsible he is? You see how much character he has? See the dedication? I mean, he was faithful and responsible in the little task. He was a good steward, faithful in the little things so that God could entrust him with greater things. And I think that if he had not been responsible and faithful and dedicated, God never would have sent him down there to fight that giant. So just a, a challenge this morning, are you faithful in the little things? Kids, you pick up your clothes? You brush your teeth without being told? Mom, do you mop up the mess in the kitchen? Dad, do you have God and I time with yourself and then with your family? I mean, the little things? I mean, these are little, ta well, I just don't have time. That's a giant. Get victory over that giant, over that situation, and then maybe God will bring a nine and a half, 12 foot giant into your life to take on. But we need to be faithful in the little things. In verses 17 and 18, Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of the thousand. I mean, David was obedient to his father, even in those little things. You are, as far as you know, as far as you know, are you obedient to your heavenly Father? If I were to come up to you after the service and say to you, as far as you know, are you obeying God in every aspect of your life? What kind of an answer would I get? What kind of an answer would I get? In verse number 20, David was disciplined. The Bible says he rose up early in the morning. What do we draw from that? Well, he could say no to his flesh. Yeah, there are giants out there. 
and it's the devil, I understand that, but sometimes the greatest giant is right here. Who was the guy that discovered gravity? Was it Isaac Newton? I guess it's said that he discovered that when he was at home. This is, you know, three, four hundred years ago, but he discovered that when he was home, and of course a lot of kids at the States anyway aren't being able to go to school, and so they're at home, and so this is an encouragement for these kids that are at home. Yeah, uh, I discover gravity too every morning. It's there, I don't want to get out of my bed. And I got to get up. So we've got to realize there's a definite champion, a defiant challenge, but rely on God as a dependent child. And then we've just got to refuse debilitating cowardice. We've got to refuse debilitating cowards. Their fear here only got worse and worse. And listen to this. Often, the sooner you tackle a challenge like fear, if you don't tackle that early on, it's going to fester and grow. It's going to fester and grow. All of them feared. They all fled. They all forsook. There was no one that stood to fight. And as a small church, let me challenge you, not just in light of this situation that we're in now, but don't allow fear to grab you as a church. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Matthew 10, 31, Fear ye not therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Romans 8, 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now I believe it's even in Hebrews chapter 2 where it talks about one of the reasons the Lord Jesus came was to deliver those who have, are in this bondage of this fear of death. Now if anything we see around the world, we see people are afraid to die. And it's even capturing the, the minds of the young people. I was going door to door a week or so ago. And I came to this back door, and this young gal came to the door. And her grandma was sitting kind of behind her there, and they invited me in, and I sat down. And I had a track that someone from our home church had put together on the coronavirus, and so I was passing that out and talking to people, and people were willing to talk. And as I walked in, and the, mother's, the grandmother said, is that something about the coronavirus? And I said, yes, and the girl held up a drawing pad. She was in the midst. She had finished enough of it that I could tell it was, a, it was a grave, a newly dug grave of someone who had just died of the coronavirus, 15 years of age. This past week, I, was, I met a gal, and here she is, 20 years of age. She's in her last uh, course or last uh, semester here training to be a nurse out of Toowoomba but she just happened to be back in Dalby that day and I just happened to meet her and she said that her parents said I'm glad you're not a nurse yet with what is going on there's a lot of people that fear death we're talking about yesterday my wife and I were in the big Ferris wheel and we happen to be there with a young gal that's 19 years of age. She's had to, had to go back to the States, but she brought up this, the matter of this, what, if I thought that this was the judgment of God or something. And I said, well, maybe at your age, you're not afraid to die. And she said, sometimes I am. I just try not to think about it. Now, there in the last 10 days, I've met a 15-year-old, a 19-year-old, and someone who's probably 20, young people afraid to die. Listen, to, and, and if that goes for 20-year-olds, that probably they, they might get it and not even feel it. What about somebody who's 70 or 80 years of age? It, it's time for us to get the news out to a lost and dying generation and world and generations, if I can say, that, I mean, let's capitalize on this and use it for the glory of God, not to allow debilitating cowardice to somehow stymie us, but to stimulate us. Lastly, I want you to see, and let's go to verse number 26. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, 
What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, oh, So shall it be done to the man that, that killeth him. And back in verse number 25, he'd get riches and the king's daughter and so on. In verse number 28, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And I think it was like this. Why'd you come down here? Who'd you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your pride and your naughtiness of thine heart. You're come down to see the... Now, here's his brother. I want you to see number five, that we've got to remember the divine cause. We need to remember the divine cause... In verse number 29, David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Now David, as he arrives at the battlefield and hears the challenge from Goliath and he sees the fear of the man and he sees this and that and he begins to ask some questions, he's processing all of this. Would you consider with me, David first of all realized there must be a reward coming. There must be an eventual reward. He said in verse number 26, what's going to be done? If someone takes on this giant, what's the result? Can I encourage you this morning that there is an eventual reward for all of this battling that's going on? There is something that's coming. There is something called the judgment seat of Christ. There are some crowns that are going to be dispensed and handed out. There is going to be that well done, good and faithful servant for those who know the Lord and are faithful to him. He realized there was a reward. But when you get involved in the battle, you need to also realize that you're going to suffer the rebuke of those who don't get involved. Because his brothers began to rebuke him and challenge him and scorn him and mock him and deride him and all of those words. All that, who'd you do? What'd you do? Why'd you? This is what I can read your heart, David. You'll suffer the rebuke. You'll sell, suffer jealousy and false accusation and sarcasm. In fact, in verse 33, David was encouraged to do some rethinking. Even the king, look at verse number 33. Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And he's, he's really making David think, and I, I'm challenging it. There is a battle. We do need to think about this. There, there is a cost involved. Are you sure? I remember when I surrendered to go to Africa back in April the 11th, 2000. And my pastor, I was an assistant pastor at the time, my pastor came into my office and he sat down on the couch right across from my desk and he looked right at me, Steve, and he said, are you sure? By that time I knew, I, I, I was sure. It was the same way with coming into Australia. I thought, oh, I knew the Lord wanted us in Africa, and now he wants us. Are you sure? Are you sure of the challenges and so on and so forth? David learned from and looked back to past victories, past run-ins. Remember when he fought the lion and he fought the bear? And I think if you read that right, I think the bear and the lion came at the same time to get the lamb, and he was fighting one with one hand and one with the other. That's what I think was happening. But he'd had victory in those smaller battles. And so then there was victory to be had in the, this larger battle. And keep that in mind that early battles prepare us for later ones. Smaller battles prepare us for greater ones. But early victories set the stage for later ones. The last thought I want you to see here in this divine cause is down in verse 29 where David gives a sound and a justifiable reason, he says, isn't there a cause? Is there not a cause? Ponder that this afternoon. Isn't there a reason? You know what I like about, I mean, the, many, 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 many things in the Bible you can find that just make you, they humble you and they make you worship God. But here's one thing that is really choice. God is a God of order and purpose and design. He's a God of reason. Now, sometimes we, we, things don't look reasonable. Why would God say to do this? It doesn't, but God knows what he's doing. And don't forget that in the midst of all this mayhem and havoc that God knows what's going on. 
We just have such a small God in our thinking that somehow we think he's out on Jupiter someplace and he doesn't know what's going on around his or around us. Now, the phrase a cause is used 11 times in the Bible, and it almost always means, is there not a justifiable reason? One example of that is in Psalm 69, verse 4. They that hate me without a cause, without a justifiable reason, are more than the hairs of mine head. And here's what David is asking. And he's, it's one of these rhetorical questions, one of these questions that has the answer implied. Now, I don't think he's being a snot here. I don't think he's being a brat. He's saying, isn't there a reason for what? For his existence at that time, in that place, to take on that giant. You know why Fellowship Baptist Church exists in this time, in this place? You know what your purpose is? A God of design, a God of reason, a God of... Bright to take on giants, take on giants, whatever they may be, whomever they may be. He was in the right time at the right place. I think of Ruth in the field of Boaz. Isn't that a precious story? The Bible says her hap, it just happened that she was in the field of Boaz. And you read that story and you say, well, God was directing the steps for that gal at that time, at that place. How about Esther the queen? Remember when her uncle said, maybe you're in the kingdom for such a time as this? I think of Nehemiah, who was in the right place at the right time as the king's cupbearer, went back to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And what is the cause for a small church in a big area at a challenging time? I would say it's, first of all, exalt God evangelize sinners and edify one another if there's ever a time for a church to be a church and, and I, know, I, I know that there's pros and cons to meeting that but if there's ever a time to conduct a church as a church with love and prayer and care and outreach when there's a giant there in the valley and his voice is reverberating across the hills and nobody else is taking him on if there's ever time for Fellowship Baptist Church to be Fellowship Baptist Church, it's now. It's now. Are you a part of this church? Have you been saved and baptized? Are you a member of this church? Are you an integral part of this church? Can you be counted on at this time? A lot of things in life are a test. In fact, I think just about everything in life is a test. And here we are facing some tests. How are we going to respond in the test? I trust we dedicate ourselves anew, afresh, as a, a member of this church or member of our church. Here we are, a little church, an area like that. God has been so good. I wish I had time to give you testimony. God has been so, so good. He's always good. Whether, whether we see it or not, he's always good. But be what God wants you to be so that you'll do what God wants you to do. Heavenly Father, we can trust you. We can trust you, and we need to trust you. The songwriter has written, only trust him, only trust him. Father, trust is necessary for salvation. If a person has not accepted Christ and what he's done on the cross, believed on him with all their heart and soul and mind and strength, they need to do that. Father, they're not going to be ready for death, should it be soon, should it be later, unless they have Christ as their personal Savior. And I pray for believers here. Maybe they're afraid, and maybe a neighbor, maybe a relative has gotten uh, sick or is sick or might get sick or maybe has a weak immune system. That